Right, let's get started then. So, um, welcome to tonight. Um, we ran a series of uh, webinars last year on the Coast of Cozy, and we got pretty good feedback about them. The focus for tonight's webinar is our runners. Um, last year we heard from Ewan, Ewan Horsburgh, and hopefully I've pronounced your surname right. It's done in a good old Scottish accent, Ewan, Ewan Horsburgh. And one and only Greg Wallace as well. Um, so they gave us um, a couple of insights from like the front of the pack and uh, maybe the middle or the back of the pack, Greg. Um, but we get pretty decent insights from those guys. Um, so I'll let Greg introduce the two runners who we're going to put on, under the spotlight tonight. I'll let Greg introduce them. But all we're really looking for is like their insights, their perspectives, their opinions on how he kind of run and succeed in the Coasty Causey. Mm -hmm. Before I hand over to Greg, just a quick update. So under four weeks now, before we um, before we tow the line, um, yesterday we get really good news that regional is open. Yes. So notwithstanding more COVID shit being thrown our way, then uh, the race is good to go. Um, this year, uh, we've got just under 40% of our runners are female, so two-fifths of our runners are email, uh, female, and um, we'll get the blokes uh, comprised of uh, three-fifths of the race. In terms of newbies, one-third of the field is newbies, and the rest are returning runners. So specifically for the newbies, you know, this should be really useful, and um, hopefully it is. And without further ado, I'll let Greg introduce the guys. Thanks, Mickey, and uh, really great to see everybody. And thanks again for joining us. We are recording this and we will post it on social media as well. Last week's webinar was also recorded and we'll post that up as well uh, in the coming days. But the uh, two runners who are going to hear from this evening uh, probably don't really need any introduction. Um, we have the uh, fabulous Jane Trumper, uh, now with nine finishes at Costa Cozy. Um, uh, first woman to run Simpson Desert, let alone the, the well over 2,000 kilometre, I think 2,200 kilometre Canary to Rome trail as well. Um, and it's all be almost worth uh, interviewing your husband, Jane, given he's run well over 200 marathons as well. I don't know how you cope with two athletes in the house, but um, that will be fine. So we'd love to hear from Jane and, and Jane's experience. Uh, I think you did your first one when you were 50 and your, your last one last year when you were 60. Um, also joining us is Shane Simpson uh, from uh, Leonie uh, and Glenbrook at the Lower Blue Mountains. And Shane may be well familiar to you um, as the face of uh, Blue Mountains Running Company. And Shane's got uh, three... Costa Cozzi's under his belt, fit successful finishes with Costa Cozzi, as well as Tahoe, the 200 miler Tahoe, Leadville, Western States, and the classic roll call of, of ultras. Um, and again, both our runners have experienced a mixed bag of races as opposed to things going perfectly or, or not. And that's why it's really interesting to hear their perspectives on uh, Costa Cozzi, um, both good, bad, and Interesting, no doubt. Uh, so with that, uh, we'd really like to just hear from you. And what, I suppose, first got you into either, whether it's running or Coast to Cozzy, uh, Shane? Uh, I, always, I was always a bit of a runner. I'd sort of take myself up as a, as a young bloke for, for jogs and things and always loved cross country and stuff. I played rugby league like up till sort of my really late 20s. And I think... When that finishes and the, and the team sport and that sort of competitive thing it finishes you're sort of at a bit of a loss of a lot of people i think go through the same and you look for something else and um heard about you know six foot track marathon once and thought i'll have a crack at that and had no idea what we we're sort of getting in for but that that was the start of a, a really um a really passionate sort of uh, relationship i've had with running since then and um, it was a similar type thing with Costa Cozzi. you know i think i'd done a, a north face 100 or two north face 100 and uh heard about the, the coast of Cozzy and turned up once, I think it was 10 years ago now, 2011, completely unprepared and a bit like a deer in headlights. And you were down there, Craig, with me and 
Um, yeah, it, it, that was the start of it all. So that's my sort of history in it. Fun, wonderful. I think I spent most of my first time uh, uh, crafting myself, and I think I, was, I spent most of the time in the toilets at the Eden Fishman's Club going, oh, my <laughs> God, oh, my God, oh, my God. What am I doing with all these people? Anyway, Jane. Jane, tell us, like we know so much, we've heard a lot of, of what you've done and a lot of the, lot of the great stories. What perhaps uh, attracted you to the longer distance stuff and also what attracted you to Coast to Cozzy, the original first time? Ooh. Jane, we can't hear you for once. <laughs> Oh, we still can't hear Jane. Probably a good thing. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there you go. Thank Where you. Are you? All right. Um, I, I had a brother that um, died of heart disease when I was doing UTA 100 back in, before I did a Coast to Cozzy. And my biggest thing with Coast to Cozzy was seeing Andrew Hewitt and Spud Murphy with hats on. Um, one December, the year before I ran it, and I just said, I have to have a hat. And um, I had no idea what I had to do to get the damn hat. And ever since, I've just got the damn hat pin. But um, it, it, it was basically just wanting to be part of a really cool group of runners. Um, the way you have to actually get to the top of Mount Kosciuszko was a lot harder than just wanting a hat. But um, it... To me, it was more about the camaraderie and there's no other race, no other race where you want everyone to finish. And, you know, ever since that first year, I think it was 2009, um, you, you start on the sand with people and you just feel like they are your best friends and you've known them forever. And um, you, 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 you will do whatever you can to help anyone get through to the top of the Streslecky Monument and back down to Charlotte Pass. Um, yes. So to me, it was more just the camaraderie, um, not wanting to see anyone in their crew car, Shane Simpson, being, you know, driven to, to, to DNF a race. To me, it was just like, damn it, like get out of that car and keep me company for a while. And it, to me, it's, it is, it's all about, being with, with like-minded people and just in, really enjoying the weekend. I'm never going to win. And I think this is where I think a lot of the newbies just need to say, you know what, this is my first time. Just enjoy it. Like the, the sorry, I'm going to keep on going because one, exactly. of the, <laughs> one, one of the people in my first crew is an astrophysicist. And we got to Charlotte Pass and she had a bottle of champagne in her backpack. And we got up to the, to the Streslecky Monument and Lewis and my other two crew were quite happy to sit up there and just watch the stars. We didn't give a damn what our time was. I think I finished in about 43 hours. And we sat up there and we drank a bottle of champagne and we went back down to Charlotte Pass and we felt like we'd won. So <laughs> I, I think that the newbies need to actually just say, you know what, if you're not going to win, for God's sake, enjoy it. Well, that's so true, Jane. It's um, it's not until you actually experience um, that uniqueness of the coast to Cozy and the camaraderie that it does actually enjoy. Um, I'm sure everybody will experience that, especially the newbies first time around. Jane, what would you say has you been your most memorable coast to Cozy? I hate to say it, but they all sort of just melt into one. I think probably. The most sober moment I've had is going up to Charlotte Pass at a hundred, like a right angle, and people, people, yeah, thanks, Craig. Look at him laughing. Um, a lot of people just said, "There's no way in the world she's going to do the 18Ks to get up and back down again, looking like that." Um, so I think that was probably the the toughest. Mm -hmm. and, you know, definitely harder than doing vaginally delivering a 4.2 kilo baby. And um, I think I, I had <laughs> a much bigger audience watching me doing that, that final 18 Ks. I mean, thank God for Whippet. He was up there massaging me and someone's going, someone's going to beat you. And I said, I don't care. Like, just, I just got to finish this. Um, I, that was probably the most um, 
lucid moment I have of of a finish. So there was no champagne drinking at the Stres Lecky Monument that time? No, no. no. Nah. But I do remember going, why is there, I was standing at the time and I remember going, why is there a child on the course? It was Jane bent over. But that's, <laughs> Jane, for you, your most, your most I suppose, uh, 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 memorable coast to cousin. I think, like Jane said, I think the first one's really memorable. I think the second one that I went, like the year after in 2012, I, I, I did the first one much the same as you did, Greg and Jane did. I think 43 hours was the same for me, but I didn't, um, I was going a bit slow. I didn't have time for champagne. I was just trying to get back down the hill. Um, the year after, sort of went back then, and it was a it was a different story. I sort of I think that first one fills you with a bit of confidence that you can do it, and maybe you do have a spot there. And um, th- had a really good day that day. Things everything seemed to go well, which, as everyone knows who's done it, not often happens on Coast to Cozzy. But it was um, the sec- the year after 2012 was a really memorable one for me. Fantastic. And look, one of the different things about Kosciuszko that uh, people haven't done before. One of the differences is you have your crew with you pretty well the whole way, bar the little piece at the start. So you, your crew experience it with you. Uh, what do you need most from your support crew? What do you need and what do you need most from your support crew, Shane? I think it's, um, it's different on different days, you know, and, and it, that's, I guess, the important part about having a really good dynamic and good relationship with your support crew. So, um, if, you know, if you're lucky and you get, you get to cart the same same team down the year after year, they know you really well and they know what you need and what sort of mindset and, and how things are going. I think you just need you, you need tough love, obviously. Um, you need to kick up kick up the ass when you do. You sort of can't have. Um, and I find this with with new people and people who you you talk to over the years. You go, oh, I'd love to come down and support crew, and they're actually in awe of of the race. And you can't have that. You can't have people being in awe of what you're doing. You need people who are in, committed to it and 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 sort of pushing you along. So I just think understanding and empathy, but also a bit of tough love at the same time. So, um, yeah, just, and, and, you know, they tire with you probably more so, but they, they, they start on the beach there and they, they look as ratty as you do by the end of it. And it's, it's magnificent. <laughs> yeah, they do smell a bit. <laughs> Jay, what about you? Um, communication and manners. I think um, <laughs> I've, I've seen some some runners being pretty rude to their crew and I just sort of think, you know, these guys have given up three or four days of their, you know, their year to, to help you get to the top. Yeah. Um, I've, I've got a fantastic crew this year. One includes my husband who knows me pretty well after 36 years, but um, the other two are really good mates. I've been training with um, Katie, who was um, a previous winner um and Zed who has never been down to Coast to Cozzy and he's going to love it and I just think that they they know what I want and to me it's I don't I don't care this is number 10 I'm going to finish um if it's in 45 hours I don't care if I keep you guys up um but it's 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 more making sure I'm eating making sure I'm drinking making sure you know if, if I'm walking across the road and I'm zombie like put me in the car for 20 minutes i've never had more than like a 10 minute sleep in the nine cosies i've finished and this year i sort of feel there's there's a moment sort of between you know, close to getting close to dalgetty and beloka range where you know if i want to sleep for half an hour um before it gets light i'm going to mm. hey jane um oh, it's interesting your kind of comments here around the manners at least um, because, yeah, I don't think anybody in Coastie Cozy actually tolerates that behaviour. So long may that last. And people get, do get called out for it as well. What's that? Um, Jamie, what, oh, what right. do you do to mentally prepare? Was that Shane or Jane? Jane. Oh, uh, yeah. I think we could have chose different people tonight, Greg. <laughs> All right, my accent's kicked in already. Jane, that was a question for you first. How do I mentally prepare? Yeah, I, and how do you kind of keep going during the race on a mental basis? I think during the race I'm fine. It's the 364 days beforehand that is all-consuming. And, I, you know, I've really said this is it. This is number 10, never again. And it it does, it takes up so much of your life. Um, You know, you live and breathe it because 
it, it, it is, it's Christmas without the family bullshit. And it, it you know, Christmas doesn't happen post Aussie. And I really want the newbies to, to feel that way. I, you know, it's, it's not a race. It's not just something that you enter and you finish and you never feel the love for ever again. It, it's, it's, it's mentally, you're in the moment. When you hit the sand at Eden, at, at, on Twofold Bay, you, you've got a job to do and you do it for as long as you have to. But it's, it's the time before the race day that it's, it's thinking about it. And um, unfortunately, after nine times, I know the course and I know, you know, after Cathcart, once you turn right, um, when you're on your own, it's pretty horrible. It's sort of like, oh, I wish I had someone to run with. You know, the first few years I had my crew, my crew were allowed to run with me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and now it's sort of like, just get to that dead tree in daylight, get to the checkpoint, and then hopefully it'll be dark and I can have someone to, to, to be with me. But mentally, mentally I, th I think it, it's all, it all happens beforehand. It's all, once you're there, you just have to finish. Great. And Shane, what about you? Pretty similar to what Jane said. I think that, um, look, it, it, didn't, it didn't go as, go all that well for me, the, the mental strategy and whatnot last year. Like I'm coming off a, a DNF, which is sort of makes me, you know, even more determined to get in and do that. But I think as a, as a general thing, I'm pretty upbeat, so I don't really entertain the negative of it and I don't have contingency plans. So I sort of know that it's going to be a bit awful in stages. And, and look, you want it to be. You don't want to get to the end of that and um, and it had been not as hard as you expected or whatever, but you feed off the people that you're running with and you, and you chat to along the way and you feed, you know, the people you meet at the at the race brief and all that sort of stuff. So it's it's just a really good feeling. It's very easy to get pulled along for different sections and, and there's parts out there where it's lonely and miserable and windy and yucky, but um, they, they certainly pass. So it's a, it's a patience game, but I, I just think you, you expect the unexpected and, and, and stay positive and um, I, I hate wind. Wind drives me absolutely mental. And a few years ago, I think it was 2016, it was the windiest day I've ever experienced. And I, I knew I was on and knew I was good because it didn't play one single part in my mind. And that's you need to be at that that level on that day, I think, that, that nothing's going to bother you. Cool. It was probably good you weren't up there in the top last year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was, she was blowing hard. Because yeah. he was accounting for uh, everything and... I know we've got the snow on top this year, which again we'll communicate more about that at the appropriate time. But again, it makes each race different and and special. Mm -hmm. um, you've both done a few races. Uh, what? How did? What would you say is the difference or the the key factors between your slowest time and your fastest time? Other than obviously running more quickly, but what's been the differentiator between doing it well and really struggling, Jane? I think that. Um the first year or so that you, you very conservative and you, and you, I, I don't know, the first year I went down there, I sort of felt that I was pretty lucky probably to be granted a place and maybe didn't belong down there. So I was super, super conservative and um, yeah, and struggled too, because when that you run for an extra 10 or 12 hours than you might now, and it's a long time to be on your feet. So um, I think that, and then you, you get one under your belt, whatever, and you definitely think, um, you definitely find places and you think in your head about different places where you could have made more of a move. And that that little incremental move along rather than a walk, if you're capable of doing it, can make a massive difference over 40 or 80 kilometres. You know, I, I train really regularly. My training partner's Kristen Brace, and she obviously did it for the first time last year. And, and she's sort of identified spots where she can maybe push a little bit better and it wouldn't have harmed her. So I think that's probably the main the main thing. And, and obviously if you get a good day you, you you can you can sort of make headway thank you jane your perspective i i think there's there's so much um weather involvement in coast of i mean i i finished my best run was i think what was it 2013 yeah and i was in a, a running dress all day and i finished in daylight the weather was perfect you know you, you don't always get that and even last year um, I, I threw out what time I wanted to do because I thought it's too hot to worry about sticking to, you know, my time to Cathcart, my time to Dalgetty, all this sort of stuff. It's like, you know, it's damn hot. Just concentrate on looking after yourself on day one because there's always day two. And um, for me, as long as I'm in front of Jan Herman, 
Um, <laughs> I, I feel good, and and I, I sort of feel like I'm I'm I'm, a, I'm I am a slow achiever. Like I will be in my spot by Big Jack, and no one will pass me. And then once I get up Big Jack and I start going towards Cathcart, you'll see people that have gone out far too fast. Like just just slow it all down. Just just enjoy the race. I don't think my time to Cathcart was much faster in 2013 than it was in nearly any other year. But the weather played a big part and I think you you need to, you need to run a smart race and you need to say, you know, this, this is my year or maybe it's not and I'm just going to finish. Mm. And actually, Ian tells me he's been training the house down. So you better... You better. <laughs> Ian, would you like to comment on that? Hello. <laughs> Can you hear me? There he is. Good to see you all. Um, well, I don't think Jane has anything to worry about, so uh, just relax, Jane. <laughs> yeah. I thought you might have made, a, made Jane do a few extra panic miles. <laughs> yeah. um, Thanks, Jan. It's good to see you back. How many times is it now you'll be back? It will be my, I think, 15th or so start, possibly. Wow. Phenomenal. Okay, um, Jane, question but, for you. Um, what does race nutrition and hydration look like for you? I know, Jane. Jane, I was ready to swear there, Shane. <laughs> just, just call a Simpson and Trump up. Yeah, right, much better. <laughs> I think it was Jane. Oh, you choose. One of you go. I, I don't mind. You go, Shane. Uh, I'm a bit of a, a solid food type person. It's probably maybe a bit of an anomaly. I think um, every every coast of Cozzy I've done, I've had a bacon egg roll at Toowoomba, get a bit of breakfast and, and, and push on a bit. So I, look, I, I try and eat um, really regularly and um, and solid food. I don't sort of go much for the, you know, the liquid food and stuff. So um, you yeah. have a bit of cereal. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry, you there? Keep going, yeah. Shane. Yeah, um, interrupting yeah. <laughs> um, so diff different things, I suppose, and obviously the consistency of that gets more um, more nursing homeish as the day and, and the night goes on, sort of things mashed up and, and um, pureed and whatnot, so, so you can stomach it. But try and eat um, as regularly as I can. And there does come a time, you know, maybe during the night or early morning where you, you can't take it anymore and it's, it's pretty much on nothing from there on in. Cool. And Jen? It's never pretty much nothing from here on in, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm a big, like, pineapple watermelon. I eat meat, right, but I, I, I just love pineapple watermelon. If it's a hot day, I'll eat a lot of that. Um, I'll always have lunch going up Big Jack, like a, a cheese and tomato sandwich or whatever. But this year, I am absolutely 100% drinking Tailwind as well because um, there are certain times in the race where you just feel like you're bonking. And I think the tailwind, you know, I've been training with it and I think it's going to work. Um, it doesn't mean I'm not going to eat as well. Um, probably the stupidest thing I've ever done in a race is been, I've been offered whatever drink I wanted at Charlotte Pass and I took a Pepsi Max. And, you know, it's not the, it's not the day to diet jane you know it, yeah. it's it, it's all about get as much nutrition as you can in and at night when you feel like throwing up you know it's like just if i can keep up the tailwind instead of trying to eat food um that's that's the change this you know after nine years you'd think i'd know better but i think that's probably the one thing i'm going to change this year. So that, that's a departure from previous years then, Jane. Why the change? Um, because I know that there are times in the race where I just feel really depleted. And the, the, the thing I hate is that it's never my legs. It's, it's my body, it's my feet, and it's my head. 
it's never my legs. So if I can just change one thing this year, it'll be just shove a couple of, you know, bits of powder in my water um, and, and drink it. Just, just you know, it's, it's, it's got to make a difference, mm. I hope. Especially since you've been training on it as well. Yeah. You've both talked uh, about setbacks at uh, different times in some of your responses this evening. How do you cope with the roller coaster, the peaks and the troughs on an event like Coast to Cozzy? Jane? Is that Trumper? Yeah. Jane? Um, no. I think I, you know, everything's great until Cathcart. I think everyone's quite happy until, you know, you get to that shop and you get your wee spa or whatever. And then once you turn right, it, it's this roller coaster and the downs are great and the ups are shit and the cattle grids are terrible. And you start thinking, wow, I'm only a third of the way through this. Like, you know, you get to 80 Ks, you think I've still got 160 to go. Like this is, and, and you've got to get that out of your mind. You've got to say, I'm a third of the way there, not I've got, you know, 160 Ks to go. And I, I think mentally your, your crew are really important with all this, that they, um, you know, they do say, yeah, you're doing really well, good on you, great. Um, but it's, it's more about just what do you need and, you know, is, is there anything that's going to make you feel any better? Mm -hmm. Shane? Well, just, like Jane said, at, at, at um, Cathcart part, it is that the, the race does sort of really start there. I think it gets very barren and open and whatever. And I think you just got to, you, you wrestle, but um, breaking things into little bite sized chunks and having little goals for yourself and being patient enough too to know that however shit you feel, it will, it, there's no doubt it passes. And it really seems hard at the time to, to talk yourself into accepting that, but it does. And you have, you know, and you picture what you've done, it gives it hard for the newbies, but and they could use other races or training or whatever. But I think if you've done it before and you, you picture other parts of the course that you enjoy or you're looking forward to, whether that be, you know, the tree or nighttime or whatever else. So it's just, um, it's really just sometimes just turning off and, and just tapping away. Mm. Yeah, I might be overlapping a little bit with this question, but what would your three golden rules be? Um, that you, you know, is going to ensure that you actually make a finish. And I'll start with Trumper. Um, first rule, the race is not over at Jindabyne. Like, as soon as you see that water, you think, oh, my God, I'm at Jindabyne. Like, and it's like, you've got a, a, the shittiest part of the race <laughs> after Jindabyne. And I, I can remember the first few years, it's like, Jindabyne, yeah, Jindabyne, I'm, I'm at Jindabyne. And it's like, no, Jane, like, it's Jindabyne. It's not <laughs> Redbow River. It's not Charlotte Pass. It's not Stress Lakey Monument. It's Jindabyne. You've still got another, you know, a good 50 Ks of, of, of really tough, you know, a, a, a very tough time and a hell of a lot of roadkill and the smell of the kangaroos on the side of the road. <laughs> And, and you can't run. You're walking up from Threadbow River and you don't know whether the kangaroos are before where you are or they're after and the stench is bad. It's like that is like get moving, don't think about it, keep going. And I, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> but it, I mean, <laughs> your top a, three, your top yeah. three golden rules. So number one is like, um, don't it's, think that gender binds the finish. Gender bind is not the finish. And the, the, other, the other ones are, Never ignore your feet. If you have an issue with your feet, fix yeah. it. Don't think, oh, I'm going to waste 10 minutes doing this. Mm. Fix your feet. Because most people in this race will stop running because their feet are killing them more than their legs are killing them. Yeah. I only um, need to. Yeah, no, that's it. And also, also um, I'm doing some gym work. So hopefully my back's stronger than it ever has been. But um, just, you know, your training doesn't just involve running. It, it mm -hmm. involves your mental strength, your physical strength, not just your running strength. Sounds like you may be actually avoiding the right angle walk up to the summit and 
You might have been indulging in some champagne this time around again. Pete, champagne. <laughs> Shane, top three golden rules that you bring into the race. I think you've got to try and look after yourself. So if you, if you need a bit of a walk or whatever, no matter how early that is, whatever, don't bash yourself up with it and, and be patient. Sort of enjoy it. Have a look around, have a chat to people. I think that gets you through. Um, give yourself little bits of acknowledgement. Like if you're doing well in a, in a section there, have, have a little chat to yourself and acknowledge that you, that was a good little section or whatever and that you're feeling good or whatever because I think that then counterbalances when, you, when you're feeling shit as well. So you're not just beating yourself up as opposed to giving yourself a little tap on the back. Um, and you just set yourself on on landmarks or, or parts of that that thing to sort of again like dissect it into smaller pieces rather it's, it's too big to look towards the end or look to a Dalgetty or a Jindabyne sometimes it's 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 other things mm. it's landmarks or you know yeah it's probably for me yeah but sometimes it actually comes down to the next fence post even <laughs> yeah. you get into there it does. the next fence post after that mm. um, something also for new runners to get used to with Coast to Coast is the leapfrogging aspect. And again, we spoke a little bit at the start about how one of the great aspects of the race is actually your crew experience the race with you rather than seeing you every 20K at a checkpoint or every 25K. Most do anyway, unless they're sleeping or they're, they're slacking off on the job, which has been known to happen from time to time. Uh, what's your approach to leapfrogging, Jane? And particularly perhaps at night? Um, to me, it, it, I find it really frustrating after Toowoomba when people are only going two k's up the road. There's too many cars stopping and leapfrogging. And it's like, you know what, there's people to run with. Just go f at least five, you know, even 10 k's up the road and let your crew enjoy all the other crews. Um, it, it, there's a lot of dust. There's a lot of traffic. And it's like, you know what, you're usually in a bit of a groove you know, 25 k's into a race, you don't need your crew that much. Um, that sort of, I, I find it almost frustrating because, and I also think the locals find that frustrating. Once you get to, you know, past Cathcart, I think it's really nice for crews to actually meet up again and enjoy each other's company and the runners are enjoying each other's company. After Dalgetty, and you can see like flashing, you know, it's dark and you can see flashing lights and, you know, you, you, your, your crew drives past a car. And it's like, why is that car there? Oh, so-and-so's having a sleep. And it's like, shh, you know, just, you know, everyone, everyone's really respectful. Um, but I think seriously, after, after Jindabyne, there's, there's pretty much no leapfrogging. I, I, you know, everyone, everyone's in their own spot in the race. And it doesn't matter. I, I've, ha I've had crew say to me, Janie, look who's just up the road. I said, I don't care. Like, leave them alone. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not racing anyone but myself. Um, you know, the, the leapfrogging to me is, is, is more about letting your crew have fun. You know, it's pretty boring sitting in a car with people. Like, let your crew have fun and be with the other crews. Thanks. Shane, your thoughts? Yeah, it can get a little bit unnerving, the, the constant... It, it, it plays with you a little bit as to, as to who's coming up on you and whether, you, whether you're holding your pace and that sort of stuff. So, I, look, I, I understand that some runners for different parts of the race might need to see their crew a little bit more frequently, but I do agree that it's... it's 10Ks is a, is a pretty, is a pretty good uh, increments to be sort of running to or whatever. And, and you know, when you, particularly when you've got your pacer and that of a, you know, after dark and that it's, it can be even a little bit more, but it's... um. Yeah, it's hard. It's I think this year, I guess, with a few less less runners, it might be less evident. But you do find your place reasonably. You know, you start to see only the same cars or whatever. And like Jane said earlier on, you sort of find after about Cathcart, you tend to find your place in the race, and you see the same sort of things, which is nice familiarity. But it's just a bit, you know, moving over for cars and dust and stuff can be a bit of a pain in the bum. Mm. Yeah, and and we certainly encourage at you know, at least five k, uh, particularly during the day, but. Uh, and ideally sort of uh, that 10K. And again, that's just for safety. And if if when you're thinking of you doing your training runs, yeah, you, know, you don't have a car waiting for you every five or 10K, which is nice. Yeah. And if you're, in, if you're in really good shape, then you don't need a vehicle close by all the time. Obviously, if there's a you know, concern on on uh, uh, health and safety of the run, then that's perhaps a little bit different. But certainly we do encourage, again, for all the newbies that those cars are spread out. 
You can put an enormous time on your run too, Greg, because you're sort of obliged to stop and grab a drink or stop, slow down or whatever. And you do that, you know, more times than you have to. It, it sort of slows down your momentum and that as well. So it shows at the end of the thing, it, you, you really spend a bit of time doing that. Sounds like there's another incentivisation. You don't want to upset Gene Trumper, so all these newbies, make sure that you do go at 10k. <laughs> Otherwise, you might incur Gene's wrath. Mickey, they're going to be in front of me anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, Andy Hayden's um, posted a question in the chat, and he wants to ask about footwear. And he's interested in if, um, you guys... Or other guys, like, do you change your footwear for off-road and then another shoe for the tarmac? Which one? I'll ask um, Trumper first. I'm I'm a total Hocker Bondi fan. I've got some Mark IVs as well. Um, I You don't need trail. You don't need trail shoes. Like, I mean, I, unless you're going to be firing up to the top of Australia Turkey and back down again. Like I, I, I'll, I'll wear, be wearing Bondi's for that. Um, I, I've, I've done the whole of Costa Cozy in one pair of shoes before. Um, I don't expect that will happen again, but um, you know, I've, I've, I've been really lucky in some races with my shoes. Um, the first two years I wasn't wearing hockers and then Roger crewed for me and I've been in hockers ever since and I'm so grateful. But I, th I think you, you, you wear, uh, the first three Ks of the race, you can wear anything. Like it, it, there's no way in the world I would be wearing trail shoes for the first five Ks of, you know, up to Toowoomba. You just, you just deal with what mm. you're dealing with. And then you're on, you're on tarmac, you're on dirt road, you know, un until you get to Charlotte Pass. There's, there's no point in thinking about different shoes, really. Shane, do you agree? Yeah, I think a couple of years back, I sort of had plenty of options. You'd, you'd fill your bloody van with pairs of shoes and it's it's just more options, just more confusion. I'm wearing uh, Hocker Rincons at the moment and I'll take the pair that I start with and a spare pair of those and that's it. I don't plan on, on changing shoes and hopefully I don't have to, but yeah, I'm not going to give myself too many options. Can I just clarify, guys, do you actually like change your shoes during the race? Do you have like, I mean, you said you'd a couple of pairs there, Shane. I won't yeah. change. I won't. I don't plan on changing shoes. Right. Even if it's like a steamy hot day and like your shoes are absolutely soaking. Yeah, they they dry out by afternoon, like evening time. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, Unless they, you know, sometimes a, a a new pair change of shoes, even if they're the same same type of shoes, a nice little change for your feet. But hopefully, hopefully not. Yeah. Sometimes it does help just to uh, provide a different pressure point. On your mm. foot to Jane's point about looking after your feet, but it, again, it's only a change of shoe for that purpose. And you don't, I don't, as a uh, trail runner and a road runner, but um, certainly there's no need for a trail. Uh, there's no need for a specific trail shoe. Um, I don't. I don't think. Uh, perhaps the key thing is just lifting your feet, particularly when you get up on the summit uh, summit track. Uh, <laughs> It is important thing. Thanks, Shane, for that. I had a fall up there a while back. Though. Thanks for that. Uh, okay. Tell me, what, um, as people who've done it before, the race obviously evokes a number of different memories. Uh, what's a favourite, one of the little favourite parts of the course where every time you get there you feel good about? Jane? The Streslecki Monument. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I also have a little secret that I haven't told you guys. Um, my dad died a few years ago and I said to my family, you know, his ashes are at the front door in a box. And I said, you know what, I really should take just a little vial of his ashes because that will be the encouragement I need to get to the top of that mountain. And, um, I mean, once you get up there, you've got to get back down again, right? So, mm -hmm. of course, it's the favourite part of the whole whole course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Shane, and it'll be very poignant and very important then and very special for you, Jane. Shane, for you? Yeah, don't, don't shorten the course. Shane, <laughs> <laughs> for you? Uh, I, love the, I love the bit um, on dusk at about 8pm when you're sort of past all the windmills and you're on that nice top of the plains there and it's all open and, yeah, just probably probably 20 k's out and then leading into Dalgetty, I really, I really tend to enjoy. If you've, if you've got some legs and you can run there, it's a, it's a nice part of the evening to be running, I think. Wow, I that's hate, great. I hate that part of the course. I call that the death march. Yeah. 
Here, Andy's got another question. See, we're very unscripted here. Andy was asking, do you take or use any pieces of useful kit that newbies might not think of? Jane? Should we tell them? Yeah. Tell them. <laughs> oh, for, uh, come on. <laughs> Apart from the champagne he's just said. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was one year I took um, like snowshoes, think because a year before we had to traverse a whole lot of snow. I don't think so. Yeah. I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is. It's a long way. It's 240Ks. Just make sure you've got more wet weather gear than you ever, ever need and mm. make sure that your crew has more wet, wet weather gear than they ever, ever need and make sure they're all dry at Charlotte Pass. Yeah. And they all have the mandatory gear. Yes. Yeah. Well, that the... probably leads us into another question and um, you, you might have kind of covered off this already as well, but um, any hints or tips that you could offer the newbies? Maybe even summarise what, you know, those ones that you actually can, um, um, you've already covered. I reckon it's really, really important for them to enjoy the day and, and, and soak it all in and appreciate even while you're running, particularly in the early bits where you've, you've got your full wits about you, about, you know, what, what you've put in to get there. And it's, it's, a, it's a dream for heaps of people. It's on the top of the bucket list, you know, to do Coast to Cozzy. So the fact you're out there running it and just enjoy it and, and try and, um, yeah, try and soak it in a bit because it gets hard and it, it, it stages there and a bit awful. But I think it's um, it's something that you don't forget. I think once you've done one, it's it's an amazing thing. And you know, Jane's testament to that. She keeps ten years in, keeps coming back. So it's um, it's certainly a really addictive race. But you only get to do your first one once. So um, but be patient. Don't don't bust yourself early on and don't think about where you are in the field or whatever. Just take it easy. And it, it it all it all settles. It's, it's like. You know, you find your spot, and that's where you—that's where you, where you end up. Where you end up. Mm, that's great advice, Jane. Um, be proud that you've been allowed into the race. Mm. Just be proud that you're towing the line on that beach, and that you're—you've you, been picked for a reason. I mean, I, you know, Paul and Diane started this with looking at people that they thought would finish. It's not they thought would win. You know, only one person's going to win. Just enjoy the day. Um, don't go out too fast. Just do not go mm -hmm. out too fast. You know, you've, you've got, what is it, 46 hours? Yep. You've got 46 hours. If, if you're running with someone and they might be a tiny bit slower than you, enjoy the company. You can, you can make up that time later. Yep. But, you know, there are, you know, I mean, I'm testament to the fact that, that, there are a lot of people that go out faster than me and they end up behind me because I'm just there to enjoy it. I, I don't have any bells and whistles. I'm an old lady and I'm really quite happy to just be in the race. I, I, you know, I'm never going to win. I'm never going to podium. I'm happy to be at the back of the field just enjoying what was designed to be a real experience and it, it, it is you, you know you you don't want a dnf you don't you don't want to finish in 49 hours but you want to just finish the race and go i did it i've got my hat and i've got my hat pin yeah yeah thanks you that's brilliant advice mm -hmm. look what we do that finish piece is really important and uh there are qualifying criteria and uh, we want people to finish the race. Uh, and we also celebrate everyone who finishes the race. So we encourage, we want people to finish. Uh, we don't want people DNFing. Uh, and that's why, again, selection processes, we really look at people who we feel can complete the race. It's really important. With As we get closer now, um, what's the what's the perhaps the best thing or the what do you look forward to the most now? You're three or four weeks out. So when you think Coast to Cosy, what do you look forward to most? as you head off towards Eden to be on that beach on that, on that special morning. Uh, Shane, what do you look forward to the most? Oh, I think I, I look forward to in the last couple of weeks, um, <clears throat> the runs obviously diminishing in size, the training runs and whatnot, but probably, probably feeling easier runs that seemed, you know, daunting, you know, 12 or 14 weeks ago when you started the campaign and now just 
just you know cookie cutter runs and you you know that you you're sort of just about ready and I think it's a really exciting week that that week before where you've you know a couple of nights before you, you're getting packed up and just the, the trip down there it's all I look forward to the whole the whole thing getting down and seeing familiar faces um knowing that you're going to test yourself and that you you know no one once you're down there and you know you, you get up that morning you got your you got your great support crew and all your things you've done your training but no one can help you that day except yourself and I think that's a really nice um realization where the, the morning of the race it's you're the only one who can help you so that I, I look forward to that I think um it, it's it's terrifying and Greg you and I have spoken about nights at the you know the fisherman's club with, with the terrors type thing but it's it's one of those feelings where you you never feel more alive and when you start running for the for the newbies, it's it's any other race, it's any other run. You start running and all that's all those fears are allayed, and you think, oh, this is just a it's just a run. So, just enjoying it. And as Jane said, and you can't stress it enough to be patient. Don't bust yourself. You, you're really only testing yourself in in case to Cosy for mine. That's that's fantastic, Jane. For you, and other than the Lucky Monument. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And I don't mean just about this year's race, but what do you look forward to the most as you head off? Head off Sunday, beers my way? Sunday beers with Greg Thompson. He's just <laughs> messed me. You've got to enjoy the Sunday beers. <laughs> um, it's, it, it's, it's all about loving your crew and knowing that they know what is expected of them and the whole race just unfolds if you've got crew that understand where you are and what you're doing it's it's just a, a massive party bus like just you know there's a there's a lot of you know pain in there as well but it, it, it's all about just it, not just the race it's the whole weekend it's it's meeting meeting new runners I mean there are a lot of people in this year's race I don't know and I hope I get the opportunity to actually run with them on the Friday um you know with some of them on the friday because you know by the end of by, by the end of the weekend we're not all strangers and it it is you know like it is christmas without the bullshit <laughs> that um, can be our new tagline i'll tell you <laughs> i love it it's always uh i know my fa when i was running uh, my family always used to view it as our little holiday or they did i should say uh, they always look forward to it. It's always their ago. annual holiday. <laughs> hey guys, um, thanks a million for your um, your wisdom, your insights, your perspectives. That's been fantastic. Any final comments, Shane? Simpson, sorry. <laughs> Not just. Um, I hope everyone who's uh, who's in gets down there safely and and um, in good order. And I'm like Jane. You know, same as Jane, looking forward to meeting some people down there and spending some time on course with them and and particularly um, seeing them celebrate on, on Sunday with their recubras and their their beers. Thanks, Shane. Best of luck to you, mate. And Jane, any final comments? Yeah, everyone just enjoy it. Don't don't get too worked up about it. It's 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 just a, a fun weekend away with a lot of running thrown in. Um, I've 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 set up another Facebook group for people that um, just want to throw ideas um, at the other crews and runners. Um, if if you if you guys can direct them to to that page, just so we don't mess up your you know clog up your official page. Yeah. Um, and I'm also actually really looking forward to running a bit with Shane Simpson on Friday. You will be. <laughs> <laughs> So, guys, just to remind you as well, we've got a webinar next week and it focuses on the support uh, crew. And, um, you know, we've got two experts, expert support crew coming along to like, impart their wisdom as well. So um, that should be good. But tonight, um, Jane, Shane, or shall I call you Trumper Simpson, thanks a million for all your, yeah. um, your insights. That's been brilliant. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. All right. Best of luck, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. We'll place a recording of this up over the next few days. Uh, also, an updated list of runners. And if there's any other updates that start to come through, we'll share those out appropriately. Um, look forward to seeing you in Eden. And again, if anyone needs any assistance, uh, you have our email address. Um, and please feel free to contact us. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Adios. Bye-bye. Well done. Thank you.